Coming up on this Monday edition of Newsline at noon, authorities ask the relatives of more than 100 passengers still missing from the Sarada ferry sinking whether divers can use compact explosives to speed up the search process. A cabinet reshuffle appears inevitable as President Peck plans to accept Prime Minister Chung Wong Wan's resignation when search and other urgent steps are taken in connection with the ferry disaster. Plus, there are fears North Korea will soon make good on its nuclear test threat after Pyongyang claims last week's South Korea-U.S. summit justifies its determination to counter the U.S. by force. These stories and more on Newsline at Noon. It's new Monday, April 28th here in Korea. Thanks for tuning in live from Seoul. I'm Oh Jin Ju. Good to have you with us. I'm Mark Broom. Search and rescue operations are being slowed down due to bad weather conditions off the southwestern coast of Korea, where the Seoul Ho ferry sank almost two weeks ago now. The number of confirmed deaths currently stands at 188, while 114 others, mostly teenage high school students, remain missing and are presumed dead. Rescue teams are trying to come up with different ideas on how to get deeper inside the vessel and recover every last victim. Let's go straight to our Kim ji joining us from the new center. ji what's the latest? Well, guys, a video has been released by authorities which shows that the captain of the Seoul Ho ferry, Lee jun Sok, is leaving without attending to his passengers. The nearly 10 minutes of footage was taken from a member of the rescue operation team, one of the first to reach the accident site. The captain is spotted without pants as he's seen leaving the vessel, which you can see is listing. With the help of the Coast Guard, Captain Lee can be seen hopping onto the rescue boat as he is not wearing a uniform or anything else that would distinguish him as being a captain. He abandons the ferry without anyone recognizing who he he is. Now, this video is being viewed as hard evidence that proves that Captain was among the first to get off the ferry. It also appears to refute Captain Lee's testimony that he was it was very difficult for him to escape the ferry. The video also shows the dire life and death situation as it transpired. In one of the scenes, a rescue official can be seen administering CPR to save a passenger found in the water right before the ferry went under. Mokpo Coast Guard official Kim kyung who was one of the first to arrive on the scene, held a press briefing just an hour ago explaining the conditions at the time. My team tried to get inside the vessel into the broadcasting booth to tell the passengers to get out of the vessel, but we weren't able. The vessel was listing 40 to 50 degrees and there were people in the freezing water. Jion, we're now into the 13th day of search and rescue operations, and the divers are facing increasingly difficult conditions down there at the accident site. How are the search operations progressing? Well, Mark, the authorities are considering using more tools to speed up their search operations. Compact explosives may be used to take out debris, blocking passageways within the ferry, but only when the parents of the missing students give their consent. The explosives will speed up operations, but there is the concern that it may damage bodies trapped inside. Also, metal cutters are being used to open doors within the vessel. The move looks to address criticism that the search operation is taking too long. And Tian, we hear that the prosecution's special investigative team on the ferry sinking has raided the Mukpo Coast Guard station. Tell us more about that. Well, Chinju prosecutors and police investigating the case suspect officers there neglected their duties in the early stages of the rescue. The Mopo Coast Guard has been accused of wasting precious minutes by asking a student who made the first call from the ferry whether he knew the coordinates of where the vessel was. Prosecutors also raided maritime traffic control centers on Jeju and Chindo Island over the weekend also suspected of neglecting their duties in the early stages of the ferry sinking. I'm Kim ji and I'll be back with more updates later today. Thank you very much, ji -yeon. Now, search teams say they'll use floating buoys in an attempt to stop bodies drifting away 
from the accident site. The buoys will be used to detect various environmental factors such as the wind direction, speed, water temperature and even water pressure to convey information in real time about the possible location of bodies that may have been carried away by strong sea currents. Among the 188 bodies recovered so far, around 40 were found outside the vessel. There's currently a net 13 kilometers long surrounding the site and the search team is also expanding its operations to a 60 kilometer radius around the accident site. The rain much of the nation has been seeing did not stop thousands of people from saying their last goodbyes to the victims on Sunday. More than 6,000 people paid their respects at the additional memorial altar set up in the Seoul Plaza in front of City Hall. City officials say the altar will remain in place until all of those who died in the disaster are returned to their families in Anzhen. Starting Tuesday, an official memorial altar will be set up at Hwarang Park in Anzhen, the city most touched by the ferry disaster. And staying in Anzhen, Danwon High School resumed classes for all three grade levels on this Monday, some 13 days after the tragic ferry accident took the lives of so many of their classmates. The school will provide counseling and other psychological support services to help students grieving for their friends. Pak Chiwon tells us more. A grief-stricken Tanwan High School resumes classes for all grades on Monday. The school has been closed since the tragic ferry accident on April 16th. Only the senior class was in school last week. On Monday, the freshman class and the 13 second-year students who did not go on the ill-fated field trip returned to a school that has suffered a devastating loss. To help students cope with the tragedy, the school offers various kinds of counseling support. The special programs will be led by dozens of psychotherapists and art therapists. The 75 second-year students who survived the disaster remain on leave, and it has not yet been decided when they will return to their studies. The decision will be made by doctors and the students' parents, who will also discuss programs for helping them cope with the loss of their classmates. It is better for them to be together. One of the common programs in a situation like this is to have a camp for the students. The parents of the surviving students plan to have their children participate in such a healing program, which will be staffed by therapists, medical doctors and education experts. Park Ji-won, Arirang News. Criticism is mounting against the Korea Coast Guard and the government for how it has responded to the Seoul ferry disaster. Yes, it's raised questions about how such a crisis would be handled in other nations and about how Korea can improve its safety preparedness. Our Son Jung-in reports. Most major advanced countries have an integrated disaster response system that is activated in cases of an unforeseen emergency. In Germany, for example, information is shared among the provincial governments and civil experts under the direction of the Federal Office of Civil Protection and Disaster Assistance. Following a massive earthquake in eastern Japan in 2011, Tokyo strengthened its response system, giving the cabinet oversight of the gathering, delivery and sharing of information. In England, a strategic coordination group composed of army, police and fire authorities takes charge. When faced with a large-scale emergency situation, the Central Emergency Management Committee has full control and can even put parliamentary sessions on hold upon approval of the Queen. France's Public Safety Administrative Office provides coordinated direction and an emergency response team of experts from a variety of fields is on standby around the clock. When it comes to the aftermath of a tragic event, the U.S. government responds immediately by deploying psychological therapists to help victims. Such was the case after Hurricane Katrina in August 2005 and after September 11th terrorist attacks. In both cases, the Federal Emergency Management Agency took charge of the nation's disaster response and provided support for the affected. The same guidelines are in place in Japan, where roughly $17 million is put aside for fostering nurses, clinical counselors and mental health social workers in psychological therapy centers.
With distrust growing toward government officials here over the Seoul response, experts in Korea say the government is in desperate need of retooling its emergency management system and beefing up the Coast Guard's disaster responses. Son Jung-in, Arirang News. Now, amid the national outrage over the government's slow response to this tragedy, the president is expected to swing the axe and make sweeping changes to her cabinet. President Park Geun-hye has approved Prime Minister Chung hong wons resignation, but only after the ferry disaster has been brought under control. Our Chim Young gil reports. Faith in the government has eroded over the past couple of weeks due to its poor handling of the Seoul ferry disaster. With Prime Minister Chung hong wons resignation, there's mounting speculation a large-scale reshuffling of the cabinet is on the way to appease public anger and give the Park administration fresh impetus. Political watches say a number of high-level officials could get the chop, including Security and Public Administration Minister Kang byung yu Education Minister Son nam su and Oceans and Fisheries Minister Lee ju young A number of ministers have come in for fierce criticism for their misconduct and remarks following the sinking. The ruling's Henry Party says a reshuffle will give momentum to reforms in the country to prevent a similar disaster occurring again. A parliamentary committee has decided to deliberate on seven bills related to safety at sea, while the Henry Party plans to propose new bills to eradicate bureaucratic connections with related maritime industries. The main opposition New Politics Alliance for Democracy is also preparing to unveil its own ideas on how to improve public safety. As the June 4th local elections edge ever closer, President Park's tumbling approval rating could damage the Henry Party's chances. The opposition party is expected to continue attacking the ruling party over Chung's resignation and its mishandling of the ferry disaster. Jim young Arirang News. A confidant of North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is quickly gaining power within the ranks of the ruling elite, so much so that there's speculation he could soon become the regime's second most powerful man. North Korean state media reports that Hwang byung so has been promoted to the rank of vice marshal. That puts Hwang on the same level as Che ryong hae the top political officer in the North Korean People's Army, widely regarded as the North's second most powerful figure. Hwang's promotion comes around two weeks after a similar promotion to a first vice director of the organization and guidance department, also one of the most powerful posts in the North. Hwang has been one of Kim Jong-un's closest aides since Kim was officially tapped to succeed Kim Jong-il in 2010. North Korea is ramping up tensions on the Korean Peninsula, saying there's no hope for inter-Korean relations. This comes after the leaders of South Korea and the United States vowed to respond firmly to any North Korean provocation. Hwang Sang-hee reports. North Korea has labeled inter-Korean relations hopeless in its first official reaction to last week's summit between South Korea and the United States. On Sunday, North Korea's Committee for the Peaceful Reunification of Korea, which handles cross-border affairs, bluntly criticized President Park Geun-hye, calling her a wicked traitor and a despicable prostitute selling off the nation. It said the outcome of President Obama's trip to South Korea clearly justified North Korea's determination to counter the U.S. by force and settle the conflict with an all-out nuclear showdown. South Korea's unification ministry said North Korea's rhetoric was a violation of an inter-Korean agreement to stop cross-border slandering reached in February. Following Friday's summit talks in Seoul, the South Korean and U.S. leaders vowed to stand shoulder to shoulder against any North Korean provocation. North Korea has been ratcheting up tensions lately, following its threat last month to conduct a new type of a nuclear test. Recent satellite imagery has shown increased activity at the regime's nuclear test site. South Korea, the U.S. and Japan are concerned the upcoming test could be larger than North Korea's three previous tests. The latest rhetoric out of Pyongyang comes as North Korean leader Kim Jong-un revealed plans on Sunday to develop the regime's military prowess for a confrontation with the United States. Experts view the recent escalation in tensions as Pyongyang's attempt to justify itself ahead of its fourth nuclear test. 
South Korea's defense ministry said last week the North warned of something big and unimaginable for its enemies before April 30th. Hwang sang Arirang News. China has unveiled a set of documents revealing crimes committed by the Japanese military, including sexual enslavement, during its invasion of China. The newly published book called Irrefutable Evidence comes at a time of sour relations between Beijing and Tokyo. Kim Min-ji has the details. China has released once confidential documents revealing acts of extreme brutality committed by the Japanese military during its invasion of China, including the sexual enslavement of women and the Nanjing Massacre. China's Chidin Provincial Archives released 89 documents, which consist of letters written by Japanese soldiers, newspaper articles, and other military files. The documents have been put together into a book titled Irrefutable Evidence. The Beijing News said 25 documents showed women forced into sexual slavery were from China, South and North Korea, as well as a number of South Asian countries. Another Chinese media outlet said the documents showed that the total number of comfort women came to about 400,000, half of which were Chinese, while more than 140,000 were from the Korean Peninsula. It added that one comfort woman had attended to 178 Japanese soldiers in just 10 days at a comfort station in Nanjing. In regards to the Nanjing massacre, the Beijing News noted that a Japanese newspaper reported that the Japanese military killed some 85,000 people in just three days. It added that Japanese military files showed that the population of Nanjing fell to 335,000 from roughly 1 million between December 1937 and January the following year. One letter showed a soldier referring to killing the people as slicing bean curds. Other documents were related to the transfer of prisoners to the notorious Japanese military unit 731, where brutal experiments on living people were carried out. Kim min Airang News. U.S. President Barack Obama's Asia tour has taken him to Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, and will see him in the Philippines on this Monday. Despite skipping China, however, the New York Times says Washington's eye remains firmly on Beijing. The U.S. Daily says Obama's uh, tour of region has reassured America's Regis. allies of his support while Violation discouraging the Chinese West. from trying to Pass. open a second front right, on the Pacific Rim. Obama vowed to defend Japan from territorial disputes from China but urged Tokyo to show restraint. In South Korea, he pledged to defend Seoul from any threats from Pyongyang, which has China as its closest ally. Some experts view Obama's visit as a containment tour, skipping Beijing, but Obama said he welcomed a rise in China as long as it was peaceful. This won't come as much of a surprise, but as of last year, China's economy dwarfed Korea's. According to data compiled by Korea's central bank, Korea's GDP in 2003 stood at 680 billion U.S. dollars, while China's was at 1.6 trillion, that's just about two and a half times bigger than Korea's. But 10 years later, in 2013, the gap widened substantially. While Korea's economy had grown to $1.3 trillion, China's had expanded to nearly seven times that, to $9.2 trillion. The gap between Korea and Japan, however, has gone the opposite direction. In 2003, Japan's GDP was about six times larger than Korea's. This had narrowed to five times as large as of 2012. Time now for a look through the international headlines we're following at this hour. For that, we connect live to our Eunice Kim standing by at the news center. Eunice, no signs of tensions letting up in Ukraine. And in the latest development, pro-Russia rebels took eight European observers hostage over the weekend. That's right, Jinju. They have since released one on medical grounds, but seven other Europeans and several Ukrainians remain in the militants' custody. This as the West prepares more economic sanctions against Russia for its intervention in Ukraine. Here's Shin Semin with more. 
Pro-Russian rebels have freed one of eight European military observers they've taken hostage in eastern Ukraine, citing medical reasons, but stated they had no plans to release the other seven. Earlier Sunday, all eight marched out in public under armed guards for the first time and said they weren't being mistreated. The separatists say they'll release a group of observers from the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe in exchange for releasing some of their own jailed activists. The West has criticized the group's capture, and Moscow has said it is ready to help secure their release, but hasn't yet taken action. The abductions coincide with the U.S. announcing new economic sanctions on Russia for its engagement in Ukraine. They will target Moscow's defense industry. Deputy U.S. National Security Advisor Tony Blinken said Sunday that the latest sanctions will exercise additional pressure on the corporate officials closest to Russian President Vladimir Putin. It's part of a greater effort among the group of seven nations to punish Russia for its move on Ukraine. Shin Semin, Arirang News. And we'll turn to Palestine next, where its leader Mahmoud Abbas has denounced the Holocaust as, quote, the most heinous crime in modern human history. It is one of the most strongly worded criticisms by an Arab leader, and it came on Sunday on the eve of Holocaust Remembrance Day in response to a question by an American rabbi who heads a Jewish-Muslim interfaith group. The Palestine Liberation Organization called on Israel to return to the peace talks, but Israeli leader Benjamin Netanyahu who told CNN Abbas was likely carrying out damage control and retorted that Abbas should tear up his pact with Hamas, as there would be no negotiation with a government backed by a group that does not recognize Israel. Next to Egypt, where a court has sentenced 11 supporters of ousted President Mohamed Morsi to prison terms ranging from 5 to 88 years. The sentences came down as punishment to a string of demonstrations that followed Morsi's removal last year. The same court in Minya had handed down death sentences to more than 500 last month. This as the military-backed government continues to crack down against Islamists, including the Muslim Brotherhood, labeled a terrorist group. And finally, the Catholic Church welcomed two new saints as Pope Francis canonized his predecessors, John the 23rd and John Paul II, during Sunday's Mass. Hundreds of thousands packed the St. Peter's Square area to witness the historic dual canonization. And in another first, Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI, who retired last year, was also present for the proclamation. During his homily, Pope Francis said the saints were courageous leaders who withstood the tragedies of the 20th century. Stay up to date on the latest news out of Korea, connecting to our team of reporters about the issues that matter to Korea. On air, on your mobile, online. Find out more about Korea on Newsline at Noon with Mark Broom and Ah oh Jin-ju. Even when I'm Ah oh Jin-ju. Well, market researcher, strategy analytics said Thursday that LG Electronics brought in about... Korean food and drink, well, one drink at least, is beginning to take British supermarkets by storm. According to an article in the British daily The Times, sales of the Korean distilled liquor soju have increased by 42% at Waitrose supermarkets compared to last year. It says sales have been boosted by Korean rapper Sai, who describes soju as his best friend in recent commercials. Chinese cabbage used to make kimchi as well as sesame seeds and tofu are also flying off the shelves as shoppers look for more healthy meal options. Uh, the spiking sales come amid predictions Korea could become one of the world's top 10 food exporters by 2030. And in sports news, Korean golfer No Sung Yeol picked up his first US PGA Tour win at the Zurich Classic in New Orleans on Sunday. The 22 year old shot a one under par 71 in the final round. Finishing at 19 under par overall for a two-stroke victory, making him the youngest PGA winner of the season. No took to the course wearing yellow and black ribbons on his hat in tribute to the victims of the Sewol Ho ferry disaster. He hoped uh, that he would bring good news to the Korean people in their time of darkness.
Over in San Francisco, another golfer of Korean descent, Lydia Ko from New Zealand, won her third LPGA title at the Swinging Skirts Classic. The 17-year-old birdied the final hole for a third LPGA Tour victory and first as a pro. Well, weather conditions over in Jindo will continue to be challenging for divers with strong winds and waves will also get higher in the afternoon. Also, heavy rain of up to about 50 millimeter is forecasted in that area. Well, not just Jindo, but the rest of the country will also receive showers all day long. Regions down south will see on and off heavy showers during the day. So please be prepared for that and watch out for slippery roads. And this bundle of rain will drive down the temperatures even lower than yesterday, so let's take a closer look at the readings for today. The afternoon high in Seoul and Daegu will rise to 15, while Gwangju peak to 18 and Busan should climb to 16 in the afternoon. Now for other regions, down on Jeju will reach to 19, Daejeon peaks at 16, while Mount Kungang tops out at 11. Well, that's all for me today, and I'll be back with more updates tomorrow morning. Thank you very much, Gion, and those are the stories we're following at this hour. Mark and I'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Thank you for watching.